Happy Monday and welcome again to the Front Porch. Time for another episode of Monday Meditations. I hope you're enjoying the study of the book of Colossians. We are in Colossians chapter 2 today. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 17. And keeping in mind, as we talked about last week, this idea of standing firm or being being fixed, being faithful in Christ and in the faith. You know, we talk about faith as a as an idea of something we believe in. And that's true, but faith is an action as well. Faith without works is dead, James would say. It's something that's at the core of who we are. And we understand firmly. It's also a system. Jude 3 were to earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. And that's that system by which God has made salvation available to man. And Paul was writing to the church in Colossae and encouraging them to stand firm in that faith, to be true to the faith, to not waver. And you remember that James would talk about a, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. If we lack wisdom, we're to ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And he, He's promised to give that to us, but we got to ask in faith, nothing wavering. Because when we waver, we're like that double-minded man. So we need to stay firm and fixed in our faith and our confidence. Be, as 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And it's, there's a therefore involved in that as well. Look at the things that he said earlier uh, about this, this new life that we have in Christ Jesus, about the hope that we have, about the gospel itself, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And all of that's made available to us. And so the church in Corinth had, th had seen that and taken advantage of that. The church in Colossae as well had taken advantage, and he's encouraging them to stand firm in the faith. So he starts in verse 8, and he says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So again, beware. Watch out for this. Don't let someone spoil you. That contaminate your thinking, your thought process. How? Through philosophy. We have people who, who really pride themselves on education and how important education is. And it's a good thing to be educated. But we don't need to become educated idiots either. And that's when we lose all common sense and rationale and reasoning. And we think just because someone has some letters beside their name and they've spent a lot of time in study of their philosophies and the rudiments of men and not that of Christ, well, the common people heard Jesus gladly. And it doesn't mean that the educated person can't hear him. Absolutely not. But we need to be sure that we're, we're holding true to the words of Christ. Again, he says, beware. There are people in that day and age, there were people in Colossae that were highly educated. They were philosophers and so forth. And some of them, some, not all, their philosophy is not a bad thing in and of itself. It's a tool. It's just a tool to be used like education in, in, in itself. It's to be used in the right way. So that they can, they can spoil you through this philosophy or vain, useless, empty deceit deceiving in, in people into being something that they're not or, or having something that they can't have through the ways of the world. Oh, Lord, I know the way of man's not in himself. It's not a man that walketh the direct his own step. After the traditions of men, not all tradition, of course, is bad. Paul would say to the Galatian church to follow the traditions that they had seen, that they had experienced and, and heard from Paul, the other apostles, and as well as the Christians that were in that region. Not all tradition is bad, but traditions that aren't following Christ are always going to be bad. And so that's why he closes out verse 8 saying, and not after Christ. After the rudiments of this world, not after Christ. That's going to spoil you. It's going to make you unfit, unuseful to the cause, to the kingdom. Verse 9 says, for, and as here's why, in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Hey, of course, you go back to John 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. So He's He's the Creator. He is the one in charge. He's God. All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth, Jesus would say. Matthew 28, verse 18. All power is His. And in Him dwells the fullness. He has every aspect of deity that can be had, though He also had every aspect of humanity when He robed Himself in flesh. So He could relate to us. So He could be that sacrifice. Verse 9 says, for in him dwells that. Now verse 10 says, and ye are complete in him. Just as he was complete, we are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We can be complete. We, we can live up to the purpose that God created us to have, to fear God and keep his commandments, the whole of man, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. We have that opportunity in Christ. In him dwells the fullness, yes. But in him we also have that complete, that completing factor which is, of course, he's the head 
of all principality and power. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but about powers and principalities. And of course, the prince of the power of this world, we're wrestling against him. But Christ has overcome all of those. We don't have to be afraid. This is the, the confidence that we have. If we keep his commands, we can have that hope. We can have that assurance of victory in Christ Jesus. Verse 11 says, In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Circumcision was, of course, a binding covenant that God had made with the children of Israel. It was a physical act of cutting away skin, cutting away a part of the flesh. Well, we have a spiritual circumcision as the church today. We're not under the law of Moses. You're going to see that in this context. We're under the law of Christ today, and it's a spiritual circumcision. It's not a cutting away of the physical flesh, but a cutting away of the sin that's in our lives. That's what he was talking about. The putting away or putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ was cut for us. He bled for us. He suffered for us. Then he says in verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, some people like to, to debate and to get into discussions about whether or not baptism saves us and saying, well, Jesus saves. Well, that's a given. Jesus is the only source that can save. But how? Is he going to save someone that's outside of him? No. But here he says that we're baptized into him, buried with him in baptism. Very similar to what Paul would say to the Roman church, Romans 6, 1 through 4. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin, there's that separation, continue to live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in this newness of life. Galatians 3.27, we're all the children of God, 26 and 27, we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us, note it, as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And then he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. We come together in him in our obedience. So does baptism save us? And technically Jesus saves us, but he saves us when we obey him in baptism. That's the, the culminating factor of our faith, our repentance, our confession, coming together, putting us into Christ, where all spiritual blessings are found, where we can be complete, where he, we can have that, that unification, as you see, you see there in verse 10 again, complete in him, because he's the head of the principality and power. He's the one who says this. We're circumcised, we're putting off the sins of the flesh, and we're putting on Christ as we're buried with him in baptism wherein also we are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. It's through the faith of what he has done for us as he's made this salvation available. We're not earning anything. We're doing that which is required of us because Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. Then he says there in verse 13, and you being dead in your sins, you were separated because of your sins and of the uncircumcision of your flesh. You weren't cutting away that sinful lifestyle, that sinful lifestyle of the flesh that they were practicing. He says, but you were that, you were being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. What a beautiful picture that is. Now notice, that's in the same context, though, of after he said they were baptized into him and raised in him as Christians, as children of God, by that operation of God, where they have this forgiveness of all their trespasses. God's not willing that any should perish, but that it all come to repentance. He doesn't want anyone to be saved. He want, I mean, anyone to be lost. He wants all to be saved. He wants everyone to know the peace that comes from being in Christ, the peace that passes understanding. Now, we're not going to have that if we're not willing to submit to his will, if we're not going to stand firm in the faith as well. So verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The, when he's talking about here the handwriting of ordinances, we're going back to the old law. We're talking about the law of Moses. It was contrary to us because what did it do? It condemned. It brought sin into fruition. It let us know, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Well, if it says thou shalt and we don't, we sin. It warrants death. 
thou shalt not, and we do sin, it warrants death. So it was the law of sin and death. It was against us. And blotting that out, the handwriting of ordinances, contrary to us against us, he took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. Now, goes on in verse 15, said, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in his sacrifice, in, in nailing that old law to the cross. He triumphed over that. He didn't come to abolish and to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born under the law, born of a virgin, born under the law. That's Galatians 4, verse 4. And so he spoiled those principalities. He spoiled those powers. He made a show of them openly. And he triumphed over those things. So as a result, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or in the new moon or the Sabbath days. Literally of the Sabbath a law that was written with the finger of God on tables of stone. Ten commandments. You see this in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days the Lord God made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, he hallowed that day and made it a law in the law of Moses. Not from the beginning. Adam was not commanded to keep the Sabbath day. No one under the law, uh, patriarchal law, was commanded to keep the Sabbath day. You didn't see that binding until the Ten Commandments, until the law of Moses. But that puts it in the context and lets us know that's what he was talking about. The handwriting of ordinance is tied to the law of Moses. They had, of course, under the law of Moses, drink offerings. They had respect of holy days. They had those feast days that they were to keep. We're not having to go to Jerusalem once a year. We're not having to go for the Pentecost and, or the Feast of Booths or any of those feasts that they were having under the law of Moses. He nailed that to the cross, took it out of the way. And so we can't be judged in those things. But why do we have those things? No, that's verse 17 which are a shadow of things to come. But the body, the body is of Christ. The body is the church. The body is the kingdom of which Christ is the head, of which Christ is the king. We are the subjects. We are the members of that body as baptized believers into Christ. Is that what you are? Are you a baptized believer in Christ, having heard the word of God, believed he's the son of God, repented of your sins, confessed his name? Were you baptized for the remission of your sins, baptized into Christ, raised to walk that newness of life? Or are you walking that newness of life faithfully? Or has the ways of this world, the cares of this world, got in the way and choked us out? Are we standing firm in the faith? You remember that Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh unto God must, imperative, believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Are you walking faithfully in Christ? If we can help with any way, reach out to us. Let us know what we can do to assist. Let us know what we can pray for. If you have something you need us to pray for, we'd be glad to do that as well. Let us know. Make a comment. Leave, a, Have a like, a share of this message if you think it's going to benefit someone. And you study when, when you study God's Word, it's going to be a benefit. It's always going to be a benefit because it's the Word of God. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Let's study the Word of God. Let's meditate on the Word of God. Let's meditate on the things that Paul has said here in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 17, and make sure that we are faithful to Him, that no matter what happens in this life, we will be with the Lord for all eternity. And that's our prayer for you, and that's something on which we can meditate this Monday and every day. May God bless you till we meet again. Mm -hmm.